Nerfcast! What is going on? What is this? Five squares. Four more, we hit Brady Bunch. And I don't know who's going to be the Ann B. Davis of our group. I have my suspicions. Um, I mean, Biron and his loud ass apparel, clearly uh, he is Bobby Brady. Uh, we'll assign the rest in due time. We've got business to attend to. Zlurpcast TV, you recognize three other knuckleheads, but there is one furry creature that has joined this show. Uh, he is known by many names. You know him as Todd Warren. Is Todd short for something, by the way? Is Todd short for something? Yeah. No. Okay. I thought it was Todd Nard. <clears throat> uh, Todd no, Nard thank you. Grognard. Just, just, Todd. just, just Todd. There are Todd two Ds. Nards. Todd two, or two, two Ds. Ds. Uh, Orky Todd on some Orky. websites. Yes. Um, on the dark web, he's known as what is it again on the dark web? Thad we Warner. Don't, we don't talk about that. Okay. Thad, Thad Warner is kind Thad of my Warner. alter, yeah. my alter Bro ego. Broken Dick 12 or something. I don't know. Um, I, I try to stay off there. More importantly, though, we brought on Todd Warren. He's the owner, proprietor, managing partner, overlord, head grognard. President. Of president as well. Don't forget that. Even in today's times, it's still cool to be a president of something. <laughs> right. I don't want to divide the audience already. It's going to go three and two with the, with the new setup here. He is the owner of all these things that is known as Grognard Games, where Biron, I believe, popped his grease hand job cherry. I believe there's no, yep. I don't think there's photo or video. Todd's going to drop out of the call. <laughs> uh, I think Mike took the first shit there. I mean, like, there's so many. That's, that may be true. Yeah. That, yeah, actually, true. I remember that. Yeah. I still haven't I, sh shat at Grognard Games. I, I will never. What's wrong with you? I'm never going to shit in a game store. However, I do believe I left one of the first two to three pubes. Now, two to three, maybe from me because the Greek bush, or maybe two to three individuals like Taco Bill might have had one too. I don't know. Um, I, I don't all know three came back Turkish, so we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to start it off, get get a little juvenile with the humor because Todd's going to promote this show, and I wanted to get that out of the way so that way we don't have to worry about it later on. Sure. You know? When I'll edit this say, out and clean it up. Yeah, when are they going to say the uh -huh. F? No, I don't no, want you won't. Waiting, waiting for that first F-bomb. Like, just, just get, it's not, not even F-bomb, just juvenile humor. Because we're going to get it into adult topics. Adult, yeah. like dad topics. The fact that this is Todd's second store baby. That His we know of. Lived, lived till three. And then. Yeah. He put it in a dumpster. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first two years were great. The terrible twos, I loved him. Third year, he was kind of, you know, paintball guns. Like, ah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Rognard, though, is on year five? Uh, yes. T technically on year five. We've been there for more than four full years. So this past November was, our, was four years. Yeah. Well, I want to get a round of applause for that alone. Because a profitable game store in this day and age for in the fifth year like, even if it's done now, don't want it to be, but if it's done now, I think it's, as Borat would say, great success. Uh, you're great success, with, yes. So much stuff you're competing with. Before we get into some Q&A about a game store, can you give a quick kind of, uh, you know, where Grognard Game started, uh, your kind of high point, and where it is now? So we started, you know, just over four years ago, and... Uh, when I had my first store, it was just my brother and I, and uh, you know, sh true shoestring budget. This time around, we had uh, ended up with three partners: so my brother and I again, and and my my friend Adrian. And uh, so initially, so we're still considered a shoestring budget, but we started with you know an extra partner, a lot more money, and obviously all that experience underneath my belt. So uh, the key was when I went to my wife uh, those years ago and said, hey, I want to open a game store. She said, I want you to be happy and I want you to do what, what you want to do, but there's one condition, you can't quit your day job. 
So uh, that's a big deal too. Cause when I had my first game store, I, I quit my job and went and ran the game store all by myself with my brother helping, you know, full time. So this time I was able to uh, have the, the security of having a full-time job and not having to worry about that, you know, where the, the money was for food is going to come so I can open this game store. So, so that helped a lot, at least for my own mental ability, you know, m- well, mental I, I, security I say, and things like that. For, from, from that side of it. Um, I don't want to say no pressure because clearly there's pressure, but right. Cause when, you still have to you, sign a lease and there's still a lot of investment. And, yeah. you know, we all did, we all had a cash reserve and we all dumped as much cash as we could afford into the business, but still very much a, it's still a risk, but the risk is mitigated because I had a full-time job. So even yeah, if it I fell apart it and I ended up not having to succeed and I had to pay rent for two years on a store that a business that I didn't own, then at least I had a job, you know what I mean? So, so that was, that, and I, that was true of all three of us. So all three partners had full-time jobs. So that, that created some other unique challenges. I wasn't there full-time. I couldn't be there every single day. I couldn't micromanage the business like really it needed to be. Um, so I had to put in lots of extra hours to begin with. We started with not a whole lot of inventory. Anybody that's been to our Facebook page can go back and look at the, the, the days when we very first opened. We had one wall of stuff and like one row of stuff. And that was it. Uh, you know, the first couple videos of the store, John's taken video of me describing the one wall of product that I, that I had, like, that was it. There was not much there at all. Move you in know, to make sure it's full frame. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely no, did it, some. It reminded me of, um, some editing. So I, w- I was helping out with the band before they got signed. They were like, you know, I thought it was cool. And everyone's like, who are those guys? Oh, they suck. Now they're popular. I don't freak with them anymore. Cause you know, Metallica is too popular now, but no, I'm kidding. I don't live there anymore. But the fact of the matter is you were in four years have went from that level of, uh, yeah, it's a new, new game store to the place. Like that okay. is, and, and again, I, I correct me if I'm wrong for Mike and uh, Biron who, who's, who still live there. Um, when someone says, where's the main game store in the Chicago area, there's a lot, I mean, it's a huge, 10 million people. Games plus. Country. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's up there, but I don't. I don't think so. I think it's when it comes to miniature gaming. Um, from, and I could be wrong, but I would think Games Plus has the legacy. But I think from miniature gaming, Grogner Games is now the store, not just a store. Am I wrong in fluffing top that much right now? It's not a place to hang out and eat onion sandwiches. It's a place where real gaming happens. Yeah, that's actually the new slogan. You, you're gonna put that on the sign. Leave your onion sandwiches at the door, but enter for games. But please, literally leave them. The garbage can is there. Leave them. It's outside. There's not garbage can out front. Uh, deposit way, onion that, sandwiches that alone, here. That alone was genius. Right. Like, garbage can outside fixes 98% of the smells in a game store. Like yeah. that's, if anyone's watching, it's like, that's take that and put it there. You've fixed almost everything instantly. One of, one of the very first rules that we had uh and not not even rule just the one thing is that okay i'm gonna own this game store the one thing for sure we're not going to have is a 32 gallon giant open garbage can in the middle of the store because i've been to many game stores yes. that are that have exactly that the giant industrial size outdoor trash 32 gallon garbage can with no lid on it overflowing most of the time because nobody would empty it and it just it just looked awful and it smelled bad and it's just kind it of just you know. filled with adult diapers <laughs> it's filled with i don't know what it's but so it, nasty there's a store where i'm at now and this is a true story and i'm not knocking the store but i am knocking this one moment involving the garbage can i'm playing my game the garbage can happens to be near our table there's a guy that's in the, the game room that has to spit a lot i'm guessing he's dipping whatever he comes over so many times to spit and it's like, I'm thinking, do I say something to the guy? I mean, it, he's been doing it this whole time. So I actually just moved the can like further away from our table. So it's still there. Um, about 30 minutes later, a game store employee came by and moved it to the spot where it was. Put it back where it belongs. And I, I'm, I still didn't say anything. Maybe I was wrong for not speaking up, but I didn't want to cause a scene because he's always done that. He's a regular there. Um, but if the garbage can wasn't there, he wouldn't be spitting next to our table and you alleviated that one problem just instantly. Right. Todd has yeah. a brass spittoon at every table. Okay. <laughs> Made out of all dice that have rolled ones, you glued yeah. them all together. It's, it would be, I would love that. 
Uh, I'm no, going to make lots of, after this video, I'm going to make lots of comments about all the things that Brian said that people won't know for sure are real or not. And they'll go back in and just <laughs> correction. No, actually we don't have a brass spittoon at every no, table. There, there is Only on wildest Exodus days. Yeah. Right. I, I was hoping for the memorial table, the Brian S. Thompson memorial table. <laughs> you know, uh, where it's like a picture of him and he's there and it's like, oh, I thought you died because you're mm -hmm. immortal. It's like, uh, that's not a rule. I paid. Give me the table. You know, I, I bought a Julio table. Give me the spot. All right. <laughs> so he did, he God, that was it. the um, kind of where it started from and getting the, getting the buy-in from your wife and your other partners and all that kind of stuff. Um, when was the moment when you really felt like um, this is good? Was it, was it COVID getting through that? Was that when you really felt comfortable? Kind of weirdly and ironically. So, you know, every year Adepticon is our big local convention, you know, it, that, that convention's in Schaumburg and we're the closest game store to this convention. And so every year we're able to, you know, just make, make a bunch of sales at that show. And so we kind of gear our whole year towards Adepticon. And this year, you know, every year it gets a little bit better. And this year it looked like the goal was Adepticon was, get, it's kind of our Christmas, right? So we're going to sell all this stuff make a bunch of money, pay off all our bills. And, uh, and, and things were really going to start looking up. Like that was kind of, kind of looked like that's where it was going for the last six months before Adepticon and then COVID hit and, and then, Oh, now Adepticon's canceled. I mean, Holy cow. Like it was, it was jump off a of building time. Like uh, we were really seriously considering like, is this something that we're going to be able to do? Our lease was ending. So it was the kind of the perfect time. We were really worried that, well, if, you know, if COVID's happening and people lose their job and the economy tanks and we had to close for six weeks, eventually it, it was really, it was really touch and go there for a while. We just, we just didn't know. We, we had some cash reserves and, and things like that, but it just seemed like every the world was coming together to say, you know what, maybe this is the time to try something else. And then um, luckily we were able to uh, qualify for the PPP loan. So that helped us get through the six weeks we were off. And then we had a big sale to basically blow out all the Adepticon stuff. And then lo and behold, we opened back up when people are quarantined in their house for six months, they need something to do. So we couldn't keep the models in stock. We couldn't keep the paints in stock. We just had an unbelievable sales month. We had our best sales month we ever had. We did that three months in a row in the middle of COVID. So you know, it only took a global pandemic for us to get enough money to be able to pay off all of our bills. You know, we had our yay, we're broke day, like, yay, we're broke today. Like we had all our bills were paid. We didn't know anybody, anything. And then we can just start socking money away and putting it in the bank and, and, and really start to expand the store. And so even today, compared to where we were at the beginning of COVID, we've got more racks, we've got more product, we've got more inventory and we haven't hardly had any gaming go on in the store at all. So it does seem weird to say, you know, I'm not certainly not grateful for COVID as a human being and it's a horrible thing to have happened but it just is weird that that's how it kind of worked out for the business you know now so are you saying that that grognard is responsible for COVID? <laughs> no, i'm not saying that okay. um uh, no, someone's got to win now, correction you know, too there's a, there's a lot of losers from this but yeah. it, it's cool to see that i mean i got there, there's a local coffee shop here that people play games at. it's a really cool place they just officially closed their doors they were they weren't sure they were keeping open and they're like we, we died due to COVID is what their, their Facebook post yeah. ended with. And that's so common, unfortunately. But what happened at Grognard, besides you getting the COVID look, that's kind of the, you know, I mean, I, I'd say wear a mask, but you're, you're, you could be scalped and that becomes a mask. That was mm -hmm. the joke, Biron. If you're looking for where the joke was, I was I, the joke was to scalp them and make a mask out of them. <laughs> um, but you, uh, it's, Open gaming is going to start soon or already has started it? We do have some limited gaming. It's reservation gaming right now. So we've got three, it's only three tables. They're at the far ends of the store and you have to call and make a reservation kind of like you're going to eat, you know, dinner at a restaurant. You go to sit down, you play your game for three, four hours and then, and then you leave, right? And so we're not running events. We're not running tournaments. Magic the Gathering won't let us run anything scheduled yet, which we don't want to anyway. We're not encouraging or promoting people jumping from table to table and, you know, face to face. I mean, we're still no committing allowed. It's awesome. No, no committing allowed anyway. That's always been a rule. It's 100% mask. You know, everybody's 100% mask. All the employees and every single customer uh, is 100% mask. So, you know, we do what we can. Of course, having said all that, I've always kind of been the careful guy in the store. I'm the one who's been pushing the let's be careful. Let's be shut down when we're supposed to be shut down. Let's wear our mask. And then, of course, I'm the one who got COVID. So, you know, a few months ago, beginning, well, right, before, right after Christmas, I got COVID and then we had to shut the store down and we technically didn't shut it down. We just closed the doors to in-store gaming. So even though 
we do all the safety things. I was the one who got COVID. And so I had to shut down the, you know, shut the front doors for two weeks so that we could, we just did curbside, but <clears throat> even then, so we're still doing that, you know, even though, um, you know, who knows, who, who knows what it does or what it doesn't do, but that's the safe thing to do. And that's the best we can do. So that's what we're doing. And where is, is Cook County, is it 25 or 50% occupancy? Oh, we uh, are, we are suburban Cook County and I believe it's 50% for retail establishments for us and like health clubs and things like that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. It has changed so much and they've changed the way they do it as well in Illinois. They went from, from, you know, categories to tiers within those categories. So it's a little confusing, but I'm pretty sure we're at 50%, which, which is plenty for what we're doing. Oh yeah. Know, for anyway. retail, you never get close. It's only at like events and stuff where you hit. Right. Probably. Yeah, exactly. So that's not a problem at all. And, and uh, so we'll see. So I don't know if that will have any magic, you know, Friday night magic events where we have 60 people in the store again, anytime soon. Um, but uh, oddly, like I was saying, we haven't really needed those to make the sales, to make record sales, you know, and months that's in not a row. Just you. So. There's no magic anywhere, correct? Yeah, Watsi is not allowing any uh, sanctioned events to occur anywhere, at least in the United States. It may be different in different countries, but I'm pretty sure in the United States, there's no... It, it would suck to know, you know, if you had to say no, and then they find out they're all going somewhere else and you yeah. never get back. But if, if no one's having them, then I'd like to think that when it starts up again, you know, you're going to see a nice, nice push there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just like every industry that's been hampered, the food industry, restaurants and all that kind of stuff. If when, when, when restrictions are going to get lifted, people are just itching to get out and do, do yeah, some games and a bit. talk to people and have some fun and play some games. I mean, you know, we've been fortunate enough to play a couple games in the store and I've got kind of a standing after hours Friday night game that I get to play. So I'm fortunate in that, but Grognard um, after dark is pretty hot, yeah. <laughs> but it's not, you know, the, people are still wanting to get, they want to play in events and they want to, you know, play different games and do different stuff. So that's, that's the whole reason we open the store. You know, we open the store, half of the retail, half of the store is retail and the other half is game tables. And so effectively half of our store has been, you know, useless. It's been, we've, we've taken over some of that space with our retail space, but the whole point of the business was to be a place where people can gather and be community and play games to be that third space, right? You've got work, you've got home, and then you've got your third space where you go have fun and relax and, and enjoy the community. And we haven't, that's what we're trying to do. And we haven't been able to do that now for a it's year. It's just so. crazy that, you know, from day one, I mean, you, for every game you carried every line, you're like Facebook group, you want a champion for every game you from day one, unlike say like games plus who mainly relies on stocking a billion things, Kind of the gaming area to me has always been secondary you kind of flip-flopped it you wanted it to be the community first and you lose the community or not you don't lose but you you uh you struggle with them with the pandemic right. and yet things go, grow even bigger than ever before yeah. uh, I, I have to say I, every time i've been in there i've never from the retail perspective of people buying i've never seen it at bu consistently busy of people buying shit mm -hmm. i think people just need stuff to do yeah yeah, for sure. And, and just even going, the, just the physical activity of driving to the store it's and something. hanging out and interacting just with the employees, you know, yep. and whatever customer happens to be there. And then while I'm here, I'm going to buy something. Even that in and of itself is kind of a social interaction and a community interaction, even though they're not actually playing any games. Just doing that in and of itself yeah. is, it's, is part it's like of it. You're in a club, you know, whether people admit it or not. If right. you go to a game store on a semi-regular basis and even play games or don't play games, you're still kind of part of a, a club. Whereas we had, you know, there's people that were in maybe fraternities or other types of like, like gaming is a communal thing. Um, whether people want to admit it or not, whether you're embarrassed of your fellow club members or not, it doesn't matter. You're all kind of part of it. You're exactly right. Biron always says, uh, no matter how, like what he gives a, a game rating wise, it's still secondary to, I want to hang out with my friends. So it's, mm -hmm. I do whatever. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Your guy has 10 guns. Roll them all. I don't, I don't care. Like it's the community vibe is all, I'll, I'll allow it. I don't, yeah, I don't even like games. games. <laughs> it's awesome to see that compared to other small businesses um, that maybe don't have that vibe. Gaming has that. And I mean, without that, who knows what it would have been the last year for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's been crazy. You know, we, we always, our goal when we opened was to to create the game store that we always wanted to hang out at because we didn't have one around us. You know, there's quite a few game stores around and, you know, it's very regional, but 
around us there weren't there were several game stores but none of them were ones that we really wanted to hang out in and that was always kind of our goal and of course the big part of that goal is the community aspect of it that's what we wanted to do a place where we could go hang out and find people to play with and space to play and that were interested in doing the same things that we're interested in, in doing though that's what we tried to create and COVID has definitely put a uh put a hold on that but it's still there and i you know i i adrian uh you know my considering my best friend and he I met him through my first store. And so I would not have known him if I didn't have crooked hat games. And so, because I met him, I was able to open this store. And now I've met many other friends because of this store. And so, you know, even if I don't see them on a weekly basis, I know that these are, you know, relationships that I'll have, you know, some of them for the rest of my life. And that's, that's kind of the point, right? You are so, the, I would say you are like the Kevin Bacon, like how many degrees away? <laughs> right. Every, you're right. I didn't even think about that besides what you've done the last you know, over, over four years at the new store, just from the last I don't know, 20 years, I right. guess, um, yep. as far as uh, being that guy, right. I was the first vendor at Adepticon, <laughs> right. um, you know, extreme lost his virginity in the parking lot of Crooked Hat. We know these things. Mm-hmm. These, are, these are facts and they're proven. He's, um, he's, he's they're anal pe- virginity, not anal. anal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> there oh, are people, I'll edit there are people who still refer <laughs> to me. actually. There, there are people who still refer to me as the shopping cart guy from the Battle Bunker because when I closed the first store, I had all kinds of, you know, hundreds of blisters of Warhammer, the metal blisters left over. And uh, the, the Battle Bunker was open, arguably one of the reasons I had to close my first store. And so I went there and their first uh, Bazaar Bazaar where they were still letting you sell things inside their store. And I had just boxes and boxes of blister packs. And I uh, got there and in the parking lot, you know, there's whatever kind of shop next to the battle bunker. And so I got a shopping cart just was hanging out in the parking lot and dumped all these blisters into the shopping cart and literally rolled the shopping cart into the battle bunker right through the front door. And I'm like, $2 a blister. And then it was like a swarm of, you know, nerds going crazy, trying to find Smell it from blisters. here. And I, so I, I had was... no idea that was you. Yes. <laughs> oh my well, God, I remember that. Here, here's why, Mike. So now he looks homeless. Back then he acted right. <laughs> that's the difference. Oh, that's, ironically, that's, yeah. That's so funny. I, I had no yeah. idea that was you. Yeah, wow. shopping cart guy. Yeah, ironically, I look I, I, I look homeless now, but I have a job. Back then I didn't have a job. <clears throat> but, I, I mean, I know you're you're semi proud of it, but shopping cart guy is not doesn't sound cool. It doesn't sound cool, does it? No. You sell streetwise. <laughs> right for two dollars yeah two dollars each a two yeah two dollar guy is that is that any better i don't think, don't think so. no. damn wow so who do you um, think no like when you we say everyone knows mike do you think the same amount of people know todd oh todd's todd's more than mike I would oh say. yeah for sure yeah for sure I, I i will say this mike probably has a bigger global presence right because of blood bowl right todd has a way bigger local presence oh for sure yeah yeah no no argument there <laughs> now, Todd, one thing I noticed, the difference, one of the big differences between um, your current store, Grognard, and your old store, Crooked Hat Games, is people, you, the people you've hired, you have working there now are so great where it's at the point where people will buy stuff from your employees and not wait for you to be there to buy it. <laughs> yeah. 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 They don't, they, people used to have to get Todd Tread right yeah yeah. so they would come in and often my brother would be working and they'd be like oh uh, well we're working hey hey is hey uh i was gonna pick up some space marines is todd in uh no he's off today but I, you know i'm here or something like that he was like no nah, i'll come back later when todd's here like they needed they needed to buy it when it, so that i knew that they bought it so well, that when they came back you know it's todd credit now i've got good employees and i'm not there nearly as much as my manager or, or my other employees so now they don't need the todd credit as much well the magic kids want adrian credit yeah then the magic yeah, kids sure. want adrian credit because he's really the magic expert yeah it's like that the seinfeld where george has to make sure that the tip the guy going sees, in he sees it yeah and he goes to take it out you know and it's a weird thing it's almost like someone says here's my card and they know you're on commission it's almost like is todd here hmm, i'll come back like, <laughs> right what? <laughs> why? that's why i take a picture every time i buy something and it's text it to todd yeah <laughs> what you should do everyone should do is when you buy a grognard you should take a picture put it on social media use hashtag got it at grognards yep. and help help the community online grow there it does help give todd cred but that's secondary because adrian <laughs> cred is like what the cool kids want and yeah. like howie cred is what like the old burnouts want 
Right. <laughs> we, have a, we have a few old grognards that like Howie Cred, but uh, that's you don't see, you don't see them around. Well, they think that their purchase is going to buy like a new actual chopper for him. Right. Yeah. Like you know, it all it all goes to the main thing. This is not. He doesn't have like a, a side account. You know? right. Well, unless, unless we pay cash, then it's <laughs> that it's what. I don't, I don't know what you mean by that, but okay. <laughs> Uh, what uh, I asked on Twitter, if anyone had questions about a game store, one person asked, what does it pay? Do you have an answer oh, on that? I wonder who asked that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, getting back to the original idea was the, the only way my wife would let me do this would be if I uh, kept my full-time day job. Because the, the whole point initially was we knew we could, we, we knew uh, on a shoestring budget, we would have to take all the profits and put them back into the business to grow it as fast as possible. And even then it's a very slow grow um, unless you're going to start with a really huge amount of capital to start with. Right. And I say really huge, I don't mean millions, but I mean hundreds of thousands. Right. So we didn't have that kind of funding to start with. And so we knew that initially it wasn't going to be profitable at all. Like the owners were going to take zero profit out of it. And every single dollar that we made is going to go right back into the business. Now, that being said, assuming we are where we are now, like if we had started with a bunch more money other than the amount of, um, you know, customers that we have, we'd started with a lot more product then it would be a lot easier to start making profit right away. And so, you know, generally you shouldn't own or operate a game store or arguably any business unless you can make you know unless as the owner you can either pay yourself a, a living wage or a salary that you can pay the bills on right if you can't do that you really shouldn't do that now we purposely didn't do that a because we had three owners and all three of us had full-time jobs so we didn't we knew we didn't need to make money right away and we we had a plan you know three years three year lease let's see how it goes for three years well, it's almost like um you, you started very differently because of your past experience, right. your, your new wisdom, another partner's wisdom. It's almost like, um, to me, it kind of felt like if you were playing a video game, someone gave you a code to start on a higher level. Like you, my, you, uh, you my skill level was higher, but my money level was way down here. So yeah, you know, but, I, but the if, fact you, is, if my money level was higher, I would not need it quite as much skill. But but didn't didn't you help supplement that, Todd, by doing little things like if other store our business, you started gathering inventory of some stuff and yeah. fixtures. You you do that on the cheap by getting them from places that are closing. I mean, right. you did a lot of tricks to help make that yeah. make your startup money go a lot further than it would have normally. I just I don't think, and I I, I don't want to because we'll never really know but if you didn't do things and if you didn't do crooked hat in the past and learn all that and had i don't know years to ponder what i would do if i did it again um i don't know if we'd be talking to you right now you know what i mean no, like, I, I don't know if you'd have enough because you, you had to have that experience because most people don't have that you don't people that have a business that isn't around anymore don't always give it another go Right. And, and people, you know, you need experience in the industry that you're that you're in. So everybody that's tended a bar or worked at a restaurant thinks they, sh they can own their own restaurant one day. And any anybody that's been a car mechanic for 10 or 15 years thinks he can own and operate his own car mechanic shop. Some of them can and some of them can't. But I would never open my own car mechanic shop or open my own restaurant because I have no experience in those worlds. So I own I, I worked at retail stores and retail game stores, opened my first store. Learned a whole bunch there. When, when that closed up, I went and did it again for five or six more years. I worked at Hobby Town USA for five years and managed those stores, much bigger businesses. Worked in other retail businesses. My real, in my real or my uh, day job, I work for a bank. And so I talk to small uh, business owners all day long and have had that, this job off and on for the last 20 years. And so I'm real familiar with kind of the small business owner kind of mentality and the kind of trials and tribulations that they go through. So yeah, it's a lifetime of experience to get me there. You know what I mean? So, um, and like to Brian was saying, the tricks of the trade, right? You, 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 you learn ways to stretch your money, especially when you, um, when you don't have a lot, right? So like I said, because our capital was what it was, we had to kind of scrimp and save and really kind of buy things on the cheap that would, that would work rather than look great right away. If I, if I had a bunch of money, I could have bought a bunch of stuff that looked great right away. And um, that would have been that would have been nicer and would have been better, but wouldn't necessarily have made us more profitable right away. But yeah, you have to. You, we failed once, and even then, I don't say that I, crooked I, hat I, failed. I but you, did, you didn't drive yourself to bankruptcy doing crooked hat. I, I would we, never we say didn't that. at all. You, yeah. It's like to me, it felt like um, like what a politician should do: do your time and then walk away. <laughs> like you did your three years and then you walked away. 
Um, I don't, I mean, you don't have to divulge anything, but I don't think you lost money on that. No, we, we operated that, but I didn't, I didn't lose any money, but I didn't make any money either. Right. So like we basically on a personal level, my wife and I, we started that before we had kids. So we didn't have any of that. We're living in, in an apartment, bought a house, you know, while we're doing that. And so I didn't make, I didn't lose any money, but I didn't make any money. But like Brian said, I didn't put myself in a bankruptcy because of the store. Right. Um, and I, you know, I have said that owning, uh, operating a game store, it's, it's not rocket science tree, as I like to say, right. So it's not uh, running a small business like this isn't, isn't really hard. Um, but, uh, it's hard to make money at, and it's hard to be very successful with. You can put a lot of time and effort into it and time and effort, you know, elbow grease, it means a lot, right. It takes, it takes that for sure. You have to be able to do that. You have to do that. Um, but, you know, a business like mine can kind of float <clears throat> once we get to where we are now, uh, we can kind of float with what we're doing and we could exist, you know, for years and years and years without a whole lot of innovation and without a whole lot of, um, uh, of effort. And I think that's why a lot of times the kind of stereotype you, you know of the game store that is kind of dark, has a giant garbage can in it doesn't necessarily smell really good. The customer service isn't really great because those stores are just kind of surviving. They're not really excelling or accelerating or there's not going to be two and three or, or four locations of those stores anytime soon because it doesn't really take a whole lot for that kind of business to just kind of survive. And maybe that exists in other realms as well. You know, maybe auto repair shops, you can run an, a decent auto repair shop and exist forever and make enough money for the guy that owns the place to, to pay his bills. And that's all there is to it, but it's never going to grow, right? And that's okay. I mean, that, that do that, that have the, you know, all the things that we all hate, we can all list a hundred negatives about what we don't like about a game store, about some game stores, you know, like the garbage, the smell, the people, the, you know, the, always the big one for me is how do they treat someone who's not a regular versus treating the regulars, yep. you know, they, this, all that stuff. And I just, I never understand how they still exist. Like, how is, how have they not, fa- like, I know that I want me one to fail, but I, in a weird way, it's kind of like, there's, there's still a float. Like I, right. I want them to not kind of be afloat sometimes to make them do better. Right. It doesn't always happen. Yeah. Like and, and, you put it to dead on it's they, they've gone on autopilot. Right. They don't need to do more to stay where they're at. And I think that's like a game store could get away with that more than I'd even say like a car shop because technology changes there. How much does it change in gaming? Right. You see a lot of comic book stores too. Like you see the just dingy, once they have their regulars that have, here's my pull list, here's my, I'm making this much every month from these people. They don't care anymore. But when you see one that does it differently, like, I don't know about you guys, but like, I just, there's a great example of comics. There's a comic book store here called Iron Lion, give them a quick plug, um, that they just, it's everything they do is better than everything else. Like just the way it, they have like a throne you can sit on, kids come and take a picture. Like their comics are in these like arc, like old timey looking drawers. They could have been in metal file cabinets under the, the title. They're not doing that. Everything is better than what someone else would do. And I just, I, I would never go anywhere else. And Grognard uh, is a similar kind of feel whereas everything is a little better. And I think that even where there's a situation where it maybe it isn't for whatever reason, it's still in the back of your mind. Like I hear you, you know, in the past, Todd, you'd say, you know, in about a year, I want, I'm thinking about doing this. Like mm-hmm. e- even when something may not be feasible, I guess is my point. Um, you still have a plan for it. And like, that doesn't happen. There's not foresight with other shop owners all the time. Right. And it is important in retail and in, in general to kind of be constantly changing and updating and creating and, moving things around a little bit so for us we never have to worry about moving things around because we've just been growing so we just get new you know i changed out all the fixtures in the past year and a half basically so we've grown all the fixtures in the past two and a half you know when we went from our handmade tables to julio's handmade tables you know custom tables you know we do that kind of upgrade and we, we didn't start with all that stuff but we grew into all that stuff over a period of four years and so once you kind of get your store really where you want it with all the right fixtures and all the right tables and all the right whatever and then you get, um, you know, you get your throne and whatever else, whatever kind of cool stuff you want to have. That's when you start thinking about expansion or changing things up or improving other things. Right. So we just have always kind of felt like the, the arrow is always pointed up. We're always changing. We're always growing. We're always getting better. And we haven't quite plateaued yet. We're still thinking, OK, not, and then kind of COVID hit. Right. So it was like, well, we haven't plateaued yet because. We're still now kind of on hold because of COVID, but we're still, the arrow is still pointing up. Business is still really well, really good. 
And, um, you know, we're looking for that next thing. And so now we're looking at, you know, do we expand? Uh, do we move? Do we get a second location? You know, those, those kinds of things. So those are things that are now options and, and things that we're thinking about that, you know, a year and a half ago, you know, we were just trying to make sure that all of our fixtures were the same color. You know what I mean? It was, you know, mundane stuff like that. And all of our chairs were the same make and they all had four legs, you know, so now we're, we're thinking bigger picture and, and trying to do bigger that's, things. So that's something interesting. You, you mentioned that cause I know, um, you do a lot of stuff with Watsi and magic where they have a certain standard you have to meet to get, you know, a certain tier and people think that's terrible and why they telling you what to do, but I think it's great. It motive it gives you a motivation to, to take, make your store nicer. I mean, I know there was another store that had big magic events going on and it kind of shut down because they couldn't compete with a much better environment. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a program that I think has got its heart is really in the right place. And you can argue the details and I don't even really know all the details. And that is certain something certainly that we looked into. It's probably not an option for us in our current space, but it did absolutely uh, help us take a look at what we are doing and what we can do to improve the, the physical space and the customer experience and, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think that that's, you know, when people say um, you hear a lot of times uh, customers say, oh, this, the company doesn't support the game. Why doesn't this company support the game? Well, say what you want about Watsi, they definitely support their game. And, and that's a, that's kind of a thing that no other company has ever done for sure. They're not just supporting the game, they're supporting the stores that support the game. And that is trying to make the experience better for everybody because as much as they may sell online like everybody else, still the customer coming in playing magic in the store uh, the customer experience is the point, right? And so that's where they're, that's why their game still exists. And that's why games like 40 K and all these other things, that's, that's still a big selling point for their games, right? They need uh, either their own stores or friendly local game stores, a place to play the game to sell, a, 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 if not a majority, at least as an advertising arm to sell their, to sell their product and sell their games. And so that's a, that's a great, that's a great point, Brian. I like that. So Todd, uh, is the hardest part of your job to pretend to be interested when someone describes their Dungeons and Dragons character? <laughs> I don't know if it's the hardest part of my job, but, uh, and you know, I play Dungeons and Dragons, so I don't mind listening to somebody tell me about their Dungeons and Dragons character because I like to tell people about my Dungeons and Dragons character too. But uh, I would say mostly it's probably the, the interaction of the last game of magic that they that they played and they tell me all about the really cool cards that they played because yep. magic only has about 25,000 unique cards that they've printed over the last however many years and, and I Adrian have, knows them all and you Adrian don't. knows them all and Leif knows them all and I know absolutely you know none of them and so I just so I do a lot of you know nodding and smiling right I like, cast oh, yeah, the awesome. plowshares <laughs> that's great um, well, have you found a good balance between being, oh, sorry, extreme. Was, I'll get one question and then extreme can have it. Um, have you found the right balance between, because there's magic only type stores, and then right. there's old, lowercase grognardy, not grognard games, but old timey grognardy stores that don't do magic. You do both, seems like both successfully, where you've got a crowd for that and a crowd for the rest. Probably not a ton of crossover. Have you found that right balance? Uh, I think we have, and you're right, there is not a lot of crossover. Certainly there is a little bit of crossover, and um, but our magic scene has grown significantly. Um, you know, we now that because of COVID again, we had to push everything online. So we've got a fully operational uh, uh, web store now. So you can see all of our magic card singles are, are cataloged and online and you can buy them online. You can search them and shop them online. We never had that before. So that's a great thing. And our, our, our single sales, even though we did be, purposely kind of pull back our amount of cards that we're buying because of COVID. We've opened that back up again and now we're buying cards much more regularly and we're selling singles and, and packs and, you know, the, the releases that come out every three months, even though you can't come in and play the game, you know, we get hundreds of packs of these cards, the, the release packs, we're selling through all of them, even though people can't come into the store and play them, we're still selling through all of them. So magic has still been very successful for us and, and all the, you know, it's, there's three categories in a game store. There's uh, in our game store, there's magic, there's Warhammer and there's everything else. And so those three categories are really doing really well for us. And, and I, th I think we've, we've reached a pretty good balance for sure. And in fact, for even before COVID, I think our magic was, was, I, I know our magic was outweighing the other stuff in the store. And I think because we were a venue that was having, did have the room for so many people to come in and play games 
uh, people, you know, word, word of mouth was getting out and we were, you know, we had over 60 people in the store one night. I'm sure that was against code. And, uh, <laughs> And we were turning people away. Like we just, we couldn't fit any more people in the store. And so uh, Magic was really, really doing well for us. And then the pandemic hit. And so obviously with no big events that kind of put a damper on it, but we're still selling product like crazy. So, but yeah, I think we have. And, and uh, you know, if we are able to expand or move and get some more tables, we can run bigger 40K events and bigger miniature game events and um, bigger Magic events. And so I'll just make it all the, all the better. Stream, do you have something? Yeah, and just to listen to people's stories about their characters or about their magic games. That's part of like the community building too. Like that's probably the only place that they have where people will even pretend to care about that. <laughs> if, if they go to work or they go to school, they're surrounded by people that don't know about their hobby. But they I'm know not that. allowed to wear a red shirt when I go to Grognards because he's afraid a customer might ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> you wear one at Target to try to get in the back, though. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, TV. and that's and that's a good point, Brian. And that's uh, people come in and they want to talk about their character or their magic deck. And you know, I don't mind listening to people talk about their characters because I have characters as well. And so we have an instant connection there. And Leif and Adrian, they play magic all the time, and so they have their magic decks, and so they can understand and have those interactions. And that's great. And then once we start having those conversations, hopefully the customer standing next to him goes, "Oh yeah, I've got I've got a level thirteen tiefling." Uh, drew it as well and then they can start yeah. having a conversation and, and then they can talk to each other uh, and then you know and then that's community right like brian is saying I, I i that's a great point you bring up extreme because that's something that game stores are uniquely qualified for not every person that works at one is but the game store itself is a place it's this weird like um uh, part retail part having fun rolling dice part like confession you know what i mean people they come to you like uh like you are kind of the i don't even know how to say it it's, it's like you're not you're a, a friend to somebody at whatever level they need you to be at right and, i mean it's kind of like the old school like you go to the bar right and you'd have to yeah. chew on the bartenders here totally back in the day it's kind of the same thing right <clears throat> sitting across the 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 counter looking at magic cards and looking at, at magic singles talking about your your day and that kind of stuff and that's, and that's, you know, that's something you're, you're uniquely qualified for and you and you do that but i mean after you brought that up extreme I, I i started to think in my head when you brought it up about game stores i've been to where the person like utah doesn't exist or isn't there at that time and what kind of experience that creates um is it going to be the I only talk to my friends up front and ignore everyone else approach. Is it going to be the awkward thing because he doesn't really know how to act, but um, you found both yourself and your partners and every employee that I've met too. I don't know how you've managed to screen for that kind of that approach of um, even somebody that you hire that's 20, you, you expect them to be a little like awkward and I, but no, you, you found the good ones. You found <laughs> the ones that will talk to you at whatever level you want to be talked to and that could be for me i don't really want to go into it too much so they know all right i'll stop here but somebody else who may not have someone at their job or a uh, spouse or whatever to talk to they might need to step it up a notch and be a little more friendly you all everybody at grognard i guess is my point yeah. does what is requested of, of somebody yeah the, yeah the employees at your store are just all great yeah yes. thank you and, and I would say the big, the big secret there is when you're talking to an employee or just anybody in general about, about people who work in retail, and I've worked in retail for many, many years, uh, and you're talking to customers, right? The key to how do you sound like you care about the customer is to actually care about your customer, right? The, yes, the reason yes. that, that it works is because I do care. Like, I, I do want to hear about your character. I, I may not want to hear about every single interaction about your magic deck, but <laughs> I've got two guys over here that would love to talk to you for hours and hours and hours about that. Like, they love this stuff, right? And so... The, the secret is really finding folks that are part of the community already, right? And uh, that are able and interested in wanting to talk to other people. I mean, retail stuff, I can teach you how to do retail stuff, but finding people that are part of the community and who are interested and care about other people and our customers and the community as a whole, that's that's really the trick. I just love all the weirdos that hang out there. That's I mean. <laughs> Like you? <laughs> I'm a normie compared to them. You're a normie, yeah. Okay, I'll basketball, say, um, basketball you know, jersey boy, whatever. Yeah. You you do run, yeah. He, he doesn't know what what box to fit in, like right. both on the screen right now and in life. <laughs> right. Like, I'm basketball jersey guy, but I'm also weird guy. Uh, but I will say this: you 
you've managed to find a pretty good cross section because depending on what type of game store one walks into, whether it's card game oriented, board game, kind of that uh, coffee shop, clicky kind of vibe, straight up like this is where we go for 40K tournaments. You found a pretty good cross section. I haven't seen it always be like one side too heavy. It always seems like if there is a bunch of like win it all cost games going on, on the other side of the room, someone's like, oh, what are you painting up? And someone's like, I've, I've never played the game. I just paint the models. Right. And you've, you've kind of found like this. And I don't, I think it just happened naturally. I, I don't know how you can really cultivate it besides like you said, caring about everyone because there's always a, a almost like for every weird thing you're into, what's the internet rule for every, everything that exists, there's porn of it. Like for every, 57, I think. Yeah, for every weird thing someone's into gaming wise, there's probably someone else who frequents the store who fits. And sometimes, I mean, I guess where I'm going with it is, have you found in the community building, have you found playing matchmaker be part of your job? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, what you said was is 100% true. We we have a certain kind of community for each kind of game system kind of lends itself to a certain kind of player or there are multiple different kinds of players. And then they end up kind of self-leveling to the folks that most commonly hang out in our store, right? Whether it's magic. Uh, I, I think in all of our games, we tend to, and I, foster is not the right word because we don't really cultivate it. Like you said, it just kind of naturally has occurred. We have a more of a kind of a casual gamer vibe in our store than we do the heavy hitting tournament players and across almost all of our games. And that was not necessarily by design, but that's because all three of the owners of the store are exactly those kinds of players. None of us have ever been heavy hitter, really. We've all played in tournaments. We've all been competitive and have been very good in whatever specific game that we might be into, but none of us are like that. And so I think that that just trickled down and the community kind of finds itself in self levels, whether it's magic folks, you know, when we first open, we've got uh, our first magic events. We've got the grinders coming in that all they want to do and, and, and invalid. I'm just saying that they're the type of player where they come in, they pay their 15 bucks to draft, they play the game, uh, they take their winnings, they trade their winnings back into the store that pays for their next $15 tournament. See you next week. And that's what they do. That's that's how they enjoy playing hey, the game. That's grinding. And that's, and that's that's what they grind. And that's fine. And the 40k guys, grinder. some of them are. I mean, all my friends are guys. grinder. And some of them are hardcore tournament guys. I'm going to ignore that. And some of them are just play with whatever I models that, that I have in my in in my bucket today, you know, and that's fine too. And generally we'll, we'll have both of those. When we have a big tournament, we'll have a bunch of the hardcore tournament guys and I will never see them again until three months later when we have the next hardcore tournament, but this we're kind of self levels off to those, those kind of casual players. Um, and so uh, when it comes to matchmaking, you know, people come into the store, if I'm having to matchmake, they're generally not going to be a competitive type, right? Because the competitive types, they know how to find other players and they know how to find tournaments and they know how to do those things. But when I'm matchmaking, mostly it's uh, people that are brand new to the game or brand new to the area, uh, often people who are new to the store, but usually it's because they're new to a game or, or new to an area. And I've done some, you know, some, it's hard to do events or just, you know, event, but a, a thing, a meetup or whatever to try to get people to come out of the woodwork um, to do that matchmaking. But we, but we have run plenty of campaigns, like for 40 K, for example, a campaign is a great way to do that kind of thing. Right. So you get a 14 people in a room and say, you're going to play here. You're going to play here. You're going to play here. And then you kind of get, you kind of force them to intermingle and play games. Magic does it naturally with their drafting and with their events, because you're playing three games in a night, you're playing against three different people. And you can play three wildly different kind of players, but you're all more or less on the same footing. And so then they get to talk to each other. It's, it's almost like speed dating, right? When you're playing a draft game of magic that lasts less than 20 minutes, it's kind of a speed date with that person, right? You kind of learn who that person is, how they play the game. If it's somebody you'd like to interact with again, you know, it's only 15 minutes. So even if you don't like them, it's just a game. But then that's kind of how the community learns itself and, and the, people figure out what other kinds of players are and they, you know, come back or not. And, and so it, it works great that way. I'll, I'll do things like run D and D games every once in a while, you know, in the before time, and I'll get five or six people together that have never played together before. And so then I, every time I've done that, after I'm done running a short campaign for three, four, five weeks, those people all go off and sometimes split up in three or four different groups where they're now running their own campaigns with one or two of those people. And then some other people are theirs. So there is some of it has to be on purpose and some of it, um, you know, the more of it I do on purpose, the better it is to get to generate interest, but the more, but it happens naturally anyway. 
I, I think you, you, you kind of, you, you do it well because there's the old way is the game shop owner is just there. He's not really trying to match make. And then there's like a bulletin board that nobody ever looks at. You know, it's posted by one weirdo and the only one who replies is another weirdo. And it's like... Looking for fellow adventurers for some dungeon delving. Like, mm-hmm. wait a minute. All the little tabs are still there. I can't be first. This is fucked up. Um, you can't do that. I don't want to be first. Um, but what I think is great about the way events at Grognar are, are run is it's easy to get trapped in whatever bubble is your bubble. So if you are an at-home gamer and you play against maybe like one friend or significant other or, or you know a very small group venturing out can be tough if you are tournaments hey you know what everybody's a player everyone's a gamer i'll play against anybody that's on the other side of it so i have maybe my group of friends to play with but i was eased into playing with others that are maybe of a different type and you start to realize that and i know it sounds cliche but people are more alike than what you than what you expect for every group of what you call tournament guys, half of them are also playing for fun. And for every group of the, for fun guys, half of them really want to win. You just don't know about it, but they really do want to win. So that Venn diagram, it's almost like it's not separate bubbles with it. It's like they're all, they're all closer than you think. You just have to be almost forced sometimes to do that. And a campaign is the way to do it. I guess my point is not a tournament. Because tournament that specific you, game, yeah. Yeah, campaigns are great because it's kind of like you get tournament people taking a step down from the pedestal, so to speak, and you get normies, yeah, you know, taking a step up, trying to expand their horizons. And I think yeah. those have done really well throughout not just GW games, but all all miniature games, right. you know. And we don't want to force people if they would rather just come in with their five or six friends and play and play their game and and then you know on a thursday night and not let anybody else play in their games that's fine they can totally do that and then and then uh you know we provide a space for them as well because then they'll come in and do other things and play other games and they let lets other people know that they could do that as well like oh we've got all the space we want you to be able to use it for whatever you want to use it for you know what i'm saying so so it works out good i think and that's that's the point of having the space to play the games um, that's all I've got to say about that. Okay, I don't know. I wanted. To, I want to leave a pause. There's, there's <laughs> we've got five. We've Dramatic got, pause. Um, uh, until there's another question, I'm going to throw this one out there yep. and uh, give you the because we can't just serve you up these lobs. You know, I mean, this, oh, this is hit this me, is, hit me, baby. I'm setting you, and you're going to spike at home. Let's all right. get into some hard hitting topics. Sure. When you first opened, you were charging, and there was um, there was some some negative response to that online table time. Um, you seem to have gotten past that. I don't hear about it online, but I also can't go anymore. I'm not local. How right. has that evolved and where's that at now? So again, you have to, COVID is the big asterisk, right? We don't really know what it's, how, what it's going to look like after the fact. Um, but b- before the COVID, uh, we were still doing table time. Uh, and the big thing about table time was that we want you know, the reason is we want the space to have value, right? The space has value, like we're paying for the space, right? And like I said, half the space was open and half of it was retail. And when I would, if you took this, when I took this business plan, I would tell people who had owned small businesses or knew anything about small business and say, yeah, I'm going to open this retail store, but I'm only going to put stuff in half of it. And they're like, well, what are you going to do with the other half? Well, people are going to play games there. Like, well, how are you going to make money off of that? Well, they're going to buy the games on the other half. Like, like people don't understand that. Like, real businessmen, real business people don't understand that, right? That, that's not how you monetize that space. You have to have stuff in that space. That's very, very valuable. So one of the ways that we can monetize that space is to say, hey, our space has value. Understand that we're providing this space for you for something to do. So we're just going to ask you to participate in that on some way. And it's not even a fee. Like it's literally not a fee. It's a $5 store credit purchase. So you're in the store anyway. You're going to buy something at some point, regardless. Um, give us $5. You can use this space all day as long as you want. Or if you buy something else in the store that same day, that counts, right? Because if we're worth, worth five bucks or more. That's the only point. Just so that people will participate in the store. There's other reasons that are, you know, uh, A, you want to make sure that you don't really want to have the people that feel like they can just come in, hang out all day long, leave their onion sandwich on your table, Plopper. Um, use the bathroom three or four times, uh, and never buy anything, and then, and then leave. 
And it's fine if people do that once in a while, but you don't want a group of people doing that regularly and taking advantage of the space that you're paying for, right? I pay rent on that space. So um, because there are a group of people who will do that for any game, right? Whether it's, you know, magic or miniatures, it doesn't matter. There are certainly that, that is your store will become known as a place where you can just kind of go and hang out all day for free and not have to do anything. And you've got a, a place to play like, okay, that's fine. Now that's not at all the majority of players. And in fact, it's, I think it's the opposite, but um, also what that kind of serves to do is uh, people are only going to hang out in your store if they find that value, if they understand that. Right. And I will tell you that in the store personally, I've only heard a couple of people say anything negative about that policy, but that's because if they don't like the policy, they're not going to say anything about it. They're just not going to come back. Right. And why are they all guild ball players? <laughs> well, Hey, guess who won that one? <laughs> so that guild ball. Yeah. Todd still so, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's kind of how we've always described it. And, and I, uh, we were a little bit more hardcore about it when we first opened and in, in the last year before COVID, we very much, it's, a, it's an ask, right? It was a, hey, here's what our policy is. This is what we would like for you to do. We'd like for you to participate in the store, uh, ask you to spend five bucks today. If this is your first time in the store, if you don't have anything you want to buy today, that's fine. But next time you come in, if you could do that, that'd be great, right? And so it's an ask. I never make anybody. The only group of people we ever made uh, participate was the role players because we have, have a large- we, we would have a large group of sometimes three tables of eight, seven or eight people come in and hang out for hours on end. And they just weren't, they, they were, they were customers in the sense that they came into our store, but they weren't customers in that they bought a lot of things in our store. They were using the space kind of like they would use the space at the library, which I don't mind being a part of that group and allowing groups like well, that to use our space, we, but then we, we have to want to be in that group. I mean, you, you know, don't get tax dollars like the library does. Uh, exactly. But we want to make sure we're getting something back for it, right? I know, so, I know you want to sound positive with that, but I don't right. think you ever feel bad about doing that. In fact, I would say I don't like the policy as is. It should be 20 bucks. <laughs> right. Just for role right. players, though. <laughs> Seriously, though, I, I, I bring this up both as a, you know, I want him to, I want to to talk about it, but sure. also to also express how ridiculous complaining about it really is. Right. This is a, a, a luxury hobby, no matter what game you play. You pick the cheapest game out there. It's still a luxury hobby. It's not your food. It's not your rent. It's not, you know, $5 that you get back. Like, it's almost too low to even, like, consider someone scoffing. Are they complaining while they hold the two monsters that they bought from you for $5? Right. What do you mean they're going to spend $5? Yeah, they bought, they bought a Dr. Pepper for $2.39. It's like yeah. and candy for 250 and there it is like yeah i just i couldn't believe like i said it, there's a there's almost part of me that wants it to be higher though seriously yeah and there was definitely some pushback yeah if, if there's it's it's kind of like why um in any job anyone's ever worked at um if you do something you know the whole thing about don't do something for free you know if you do anything for free, the perceived value becomes zero. Yeah. No matter what you do for a living right. or what you're good at, whether it's a talent, or whatever. That's why I say like, oh, can you draw this for me? It'll be great for your portfolio. Fuck you. Like right. uh, my portfolio, that's mine. I decide what is free and what is not. Everything should be charged for. So there's a value into that, your store. You keep a clean store. You have, I mean, not to sound cheesy for beer on, but like a safe space. It's got a, you know, there's, there's not a, there's not a bad vibe. Period. You you know you've sent people home for acting unruly, sleeping mm -hmm. on tables and whatever. I mean, right. remember that. Yeah. There, there, there's a level of, like like I mentioned about the comic store here nearby. I, I appreciate that there's a one step above right. that has a value. And if if table time a little five dollars that you get right. to spend is that, um, I think that's not even uh it's so minuscule of an ask that's not even an ask is i guess yeah and I, I think the fact that it's any any dollar value is is enough right it doesn't it, if it was twenty dollars or five dollars the fact that it's any dollars well, it's almost a symbol well, at that point it's a, it's symbolic in that if anybody who doesn't like five dollars that's probably not the kind of person we want hanging out in our store anyway so it doesn't even matter it's not really the money to that person per se it's the idea of it they don't like the idea that oh i'm going to pay you to come in your store and shop well you know no thanks like well that's not really the idea who are you so, costco 
go go ahead and, and go somewhere else and and that's okay like that that's fine and you can come in and shop all you want if you want to sit down and look at your magic cards that's fine but if you're going to participate in our events and participate in our store and use our store for the reason it was intended for the money that i'm paying for it and to be part of the community yeah i'm going to ask you to participate in it at some level most people look at it they start to take ownership of the business they it's, this is my game store right that's why that's why businesses have clubs and and that's why we have buyers clubs and things like that. This I have to go to my game store and buy my toys because that's where I hang out. I pay five bucks when I go there. I've got my buyers club. I got some store credit there. You know, this is they they take some ownership of it, even if they don't realize that's what they're doing. So that all kind of rolls into the same into the same bucket. And that's one of the, you know all the reason that we do it. And I dis I don't disagree. Sometimes I wish it was twenty dollars, but I think that I, might I be know, a little so extreme. But that's, that would be sticker shock, obviously. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. if you think about it, those people, like you said, and and I hate to be a jerk, but it's like if they went to a coffee shop to play their board game every week or D and D. I don't think they would have that thing in the brain that tells you you need to buy something because otherwise you're a moocher. You know, like right. they, I don't think they have that self awareness to say, I like that's time we, we put that in rules before. We've played games, you know, either at your store or at a coffee shop. Hey, no entrance fee, but just buy something there. Like, I always feel like, why do I right. have to state that? Right. Yeah. But I do. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're going to go to the coffee shop and play, then everybody's going to buy a coffee or a Danish, right? You got to. Yeah, I mean, you have to. You're not going to go to Wendy's and just hang out all day long, and you're at least going to buy a coffee, right? So I would when they had the taco bar, but not anymore. Well, <laughs> that's you. I know, Beer, I was looking for the Where's the Beef Lady. And it's like, you know, you're about 30 years too late, and even then 30 years too late. But, um, Todd, what advice would you give someone watching that has that thing where – in their brain, like much like when I, I made a game, because everyone said I can make a game, and you know, and when you were talking about everyone thinks they can, Mike was shaking his head. He's like, No, you can't. What <laughs> those three things or whatever, uh, several things that they gotta do, and if they're not prepared to do it, don't. Um have some experience or do some research, right? I mean, you know, that all these things to me just kind of seem like common sense goes without saying, right? But it's always, uh, you know, have some experience or have a partner or an employee that is absolutely has experience, right? Um, you need about three times as much money as you think you need. So however much money you think you need, double that, and you probably need triple that, right? It's triple just, that, trouble it. Yeah. Trouble. trouble, is that the right word? Yes. <clears throat> So uh, most businesses fail or at least fail in the first year because they're undercapitalized, right? So you got you to gotta have more money than you think, think you have, than you think you need. Now we had less money than, than that, but we had my, uh, my experience and my um, skill set, which made me very confident that we would succeed at least for the first three years. Now, I don't recommend that, right? I, I don't recommend you do that, right? Don't That's do not the right way to do it. Hey, Don't hold do on. That. If I'm going on Shark Tank, I want Mr. Wonderful's experience. That, that's you. <laughs> right. If you want to hire me for a small consulting fee, I'd be happy to come on and help you make your business successful. No, but no not successful. I would look at your GW first order and go, double it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think those are the, the, the two big things, right? So uh, it, it's, it really is, you, and you have to be willing to sacrifice parts of your life as far as, um, you know, and, and sac sacrificing part of your life as far as just from a time perspective, everybody's going to know that going in, right? So I'm going to spend all this time doing this. So, so that's fine. But um, what you don't think about is you, you can call it burnout, but basically it's you, you plan to sacrifice your time. What you don't plan is how that time sacrifice will affect you at some point. It might take six months. It might take 18 months. It might take three years. But at some point, if you don't give yourself some time off and some mental time away, and if you don't start to delegate some of your responsibilities, and you, if you take the whole load of this business onto yourself, at some point you will snap and it might be a small snap or it might be a little snap or it might just deteriorate your overall well-being you know generally to the point where it makes you a miserable human being and and even i didn't know that the first time going in and when i figured it out 
uh, it was a big deal. Um, and so I was able to fix it Go going into it the second time I did know it and I still got it not to the same degree. And I was able to fix it much quicker, but it still caught me by surprise. Right. It's like, man, it's been so much time. And the first time when I did it, I, I didn't have kids. And, um, so, you know, it was just my wife and I, and so I don't have to worry about family per se, other than my wife, but then I have to worry about, you know, my relationship with my wife. And so that was a big wake up call one day, like, oh yeah, I forgot. I have, I have a wife. I need to make sure that I pay attention to my, to, my, to her. And then when second time around it's kids and not that I was neglecting my children or anything. And I had a full-time job, but at some point, you know, you look around, you're like, oh, I'm missing things. Like, I don't, I don't want to miss my kids growing up. So I need to put things in place to make sure that I'm still living, living my best life while making this business successful. So don't forget about yourself, right? You know, you know, going in, you're going to, there are going to be sacrifices because you can't do it without the sacrifices, but don't forget that other you're, you're also sacrificing um, things for other people and you may not be prepared for that. And, and, you know, that's not, may not necessarily be fair to them. So you want to be considerate of other people of your family and, and your friends and take care of yourself as well. So. Well, that, I mean, you, you being, uh, I would say a control freak personality, which um, I am at times, a lot, a lot of people have that, but you, you have to realize something like you, something had to happen. You did have to have a, a bit of a, at some point, breakdown yeah. or realization, because the only way to get past that, you're never just going to get past that naturally. I know that there's, whether it's at jobs or other projects, like when you feel like, no, 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 only like this today, like my boss called me, he's like, Hey, do you want to have someone else help? I go, no, I prefer this to do this entire thing myself. Right. Like, oh, right. There's just a certain way I want this done. Because then you know it's going to get done. Yeah. yeah. And that's just, but if you do that for every single thing, including a second career, I'm not right. talking about one project at a job, I'm talking about another career, at some point you are going to come, come to that moment of like, there's no reason why Howie, Adrian, and uh, Lath and anyone else I have there, I trust all of them. Right. There's no reason why I can't step away for a day, a week, or even a month and right. feel comfortable. Or yeah, if they it, do something slightly different than me, does it's it okay. really matter? <laughs> it's the world, okay. The world will not stop. I right. promise. Um, even though we all think it will. <laughs> yeah. And I would say you say control freak, and I would say that's a little bit of that, but more what I always say, it's ego, right? So anybody that, that is going to go into business for himself, partners or otherwise, you don't do that unless you think you can do it better than lots of other people, if not everybody else, that's ego, right? And, and ego is okay, because if you didn't have that amount of ego that your kind of belief in yourself, you never start. Yeah. nobody would ever start their own business, right? And, and so that's really what it is. And so what, like when I started the second business, when I started Grognard Games, my rule was I'm not working Sunday. I'm taking Sundays off. I can you're still a be available. Religious man. Because no, but the point was no, it's because of ego. I, I have, have my own God, my I, own entity. And I had to, you will I had to God gets out. a day of rest, so do I. I, had yeah, to I can't get Chick-fil-A, nobody gets Warhammer. How about that? Right. <laughs> so somebody's gonna have to get their Todd cred on, on other days of the week, but I had to carve out one day to myself. Otherwise, I knew I was gonna go loopy. And it's still it's still kind of like I said, it still kind of happened, right? You still still got overloaded at some point, even taking all of my Sundays off. But before I was working seven days a week and that was just too much. So I had to pare it down a little bit more and delegate some more things and get it all figured out. And it worked out and it's and it's worked out fine since. And since COVID's happened, now my Leif, my manager, has taken over a lot of the of the um of the load and he's doing a lot of the ordering and a lot of that other stuff. And now I'm, I'm far enough removed now that I'm able to start thinking about other things that I hadn't really been thinking about. High level strategy stuff more. instead of day to day. Exactly. Right. So, Does it which is a good help? thing. And if I hadn't pulled back a little bit, you know, to the, where I'm at now, I, I, I would never, I may not have ever gotten there. Right. And that's so, something you couldn't do when you're at Crooked Hat because it was right. you running. I had, 95%. It was only, yeah, it was, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that it's, it's awesome to know that, you know, when people joke about maybe like a five-year plan, like you're achieving what you wanted to, because you told me early on some things you wanted to do and, you know, I maybe even like franchise it out and have these, other, you know, and it's, it's great to hear that that's happening, but, you know, you've also put the right people in place to do that. Uh, you know, on the topic of Leif, he's a great, great manager. Um, there has to be some level of um, not ownership on paper, maybe, but just ownership of the idea of this is my store because there's that happens in small businesses it's kind of like 
you work at a pizza shop and maybe it's a family thing, you're not in the family, you always feel like you're left out. There's always that. You might take a bullet for that pizza shop. You, but you, you don't want to feel like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> I may not flip it like Gino flips it, but God damn it, I'll take a bullet for Gino. And I yeah. might have to he's connected too. But also you have someone in place that's the manager that, you know, maybe one day he does own a store. Like he's, you've found people that have that, I don't know what it is, that extra, that second level of, okay, anybody can do this, but you also have, you bring this to it, which if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be able to step away at times like you've done before. Yeah. And I, I you know, taking ownership of the business um, is, is an important thing. And I like it when I, I hire in an employee and I know they're going to stick around at least for a while. And I know that they're, they're part of the team when I hear them talking on the phone and the customer will ask them for something and they'll say, oh, you know what? I, I don't have that right now. It's the, they, they took possession of it. I don't have that. It's not, we don't have that. Or the store doesn't have that. Todd forgot to order it. <laughs> well, that sometimes <laughs> happens too, but. Yeah, it's, a great, it's a great analogy. I think back to um, like when I worked in high school at different stores, I'm at working at Sears and there was always a guy there that he would always say that. And we always would make, make fun of him. We didn't like, we're like, you know what? I, I don't have that size. I got a, uh, I got an adjustable. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I'd be like, I, you don't have this. Like, what? It's, it's my department. I'm like, right. yeah, you're not the manager. It's like, so what? I'm working he, here. My shift. It's my he, he was taking possession of that yeah. shift or that department or whatever the case may be, right? So yeah, I think that 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 means that's means on some level it was important to him, and so I, I think agree. that's that's indicative. And so I, I like that when I I know it. I when I hear the, my employees say that for the first time, usually when they're talking off, it's kind of funny. Um, are there any things that you would have done differently four or five years ago? Oh, I don't know. I hate to talk about, I don't have any like, not, regrets or anything. Regret. They're, they're not regrets. They're, you know, because yeah. there are no, no regrets, no, no regrets, no regrets. We all got that. but if, if you, you know, had to do it again and say, you know, you've got, you know, the whole talking to a younger self, is there anything you would have said? I mean, COVID aside, aside that's, from don't do it, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> aside from don't do it. Um, but I mean, take some of the credit that, you know, you found a way to, um, excel in, in an industry that's kind of hard to make money when you're competing with the internet, you're competing with personalities yeah. that don't always just, they don't buy stuff all the time. You right. know, it's not like we might buy stuff, but not everyone does. I mean, you have a lot of hurdles, but you've done a lot of things well. Is there anything you, you think, or do you think everything's been, uh, dare I say, to quote one of the early Simpsons, coming up Millhouse for you? Uh, I mean, no no course of action is ever perfect, right? There are certain things that I brought on that I should not have brought on. There are certain um, events that I attended I should not have attended. There are certain- um, Buying anything from Mantic, for example. <laughs> That's not true, Brian. Um, <laughs> he found it I, on the shelf. It's not I, his fault. You, I love Mantic games. I just want everyone to know out there uh, that Grognar Games loves Mantic games and we carry Mantic games. Uh, regardless and Armada's of, good. And, and Armada's good, well, regardless. And Kings of know, War, no matter what Brian will tell you, is still my favorite game. So I'm glad you said pe people are watching now that do like like Mantic games a lot. Yeah. You, Todd, support Mantic games, have run you. events, have you carried, were a Pathfinder formally? <laughs> I was a Pathfinder. Ran, yeah. the, ran the best Kings of War tournaments. Um, you know, yes. at Dragon Dragonfall. Dragonfall and Adepticon. I was even Adepticon with like your extra no talking rules and stuff you had in well, there. Well, the free painted miniature at Dragonfall. Yeah, yeah, I did a free painted miniature painted by but Todd. Yeah. You also support all these GW events, and yes, it is possible to support. They're not always at odds. For some reason, people right. think if you like Mantic games, you have to shit on GW. I don't. <laughs> right. It doesn't really make sense at all. No, no. You support both games. In fact, we play both. Right. Yeah. And I, and I play both for sure. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I'm, I'm a gamer, right? So I, like I said, it, I, I, the whole reason I opened the store was cause I wanted to, I, I wanted to create the game store. I wanted to, I always want to hang out at cause I didn't have that. And so the reason is because I play all these games. I play all the, all the Warhammers and all the, all the Mantics and all the magics. And then hello and all fellow the, kids, what games all the, do you play? All the battle techs and all the D and D's and I, I play all of them. Right. That's so important. you've got an open mind. There, there, how many times have you been to a game store and it does the whole circle argument of, um, well, I don't stock this game because nobody plays it. Well, nobody plays the game because they can't you, get stuff from you. It. You don't stock it or support and it really is the better word. Yeah, Yeah, you've, you've had several times where it 
it has worked and a few times where maybe it ends up on clearance, but at right. least you gave it a try that a lot of people wouldn't have. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. And and that's that's just that's just retail. That's just business and any kind of small retail store. You have to constantly be trying new things and bringing in new things. And it's the struggle to determine what is the next hot thing and bringing in enough of the new thing and ordering the stuff six months out that you have no clue what it is and if people are really going to like it or not, or if it's going to change between now and then. I mean, inventory management is one thing, but, you know, new products and um, new games, especially, you know, and, and you know, as well as anybody, everybody's got a game nowadays. And so, you know, everybody wants you to carry their game and uh, nobody want you know, they want you to pay full price for it. And, uh, you know, then I'm trying to sell it and make a buck. And so it's just that kind of thing is who, who trying to make everyone happy is impossible. So you try to make as many people happy as you can. And um, there's only one of me. And even though I play everything, I can't play everything. And so um, I can't run a tournament for every tournament for everything or an event for everything. So I try to hire employees that can help out with that. And then I try to engage the community in helping us support these games. So you want to bring in, you know, Mantic Armada. Great. You and any, you and your friend want to play it. How about we run a demo date? You want to help me run one of those? You know, it's like, my first question is always when what somebody says, take? oh, you know what you should do? You should carry this game. Great. You want to be my Pathfinder for it and run a demo game for me when I bring it in? Oh, yeah, no, I can't store, do that. Would you, would you say no. it's critical to be broad in your knowledge but not deep? At, at least initially, for sure, right? When we first opened, that was that was the key. You have to be wide and not deep. And so you carry a little bit of everything to see what is going to stick, at least initially, and then you, you, let every, you let everything else kind of go away, and then you carry the things that are going to work. Like when we opened, we started – carrying some board games and and other things and almost immediately our board games didn't take off right our miniature games and our magic took off and we very quickly kind of became known as a miniature game store which is fine um and we've tried to do board games ever since now we've got some competition in the area and of course everybody can buy a board game for 40 percent off on amazon so it's hard to compete with that on any level but there are game stores that do very very well with board games um, that's just not us. And so, um, you know, so we then put the board games aside. We carry the popular ones. We, we special order them in. We have a few on the shelf and that's pretty much it. So well, like Christmas and stuff, you always stock up a little bit. We'll stock up for Christmas because it's Christmas. And then, so, yeah, so we're not real deep in board games. We'll have a few of them. But right. not real deep. I mean, it's, you, you know, and that's okay. Right. Yeah. Min miniature games. There's a lot more upside to everything. The longevity of it, you know, is, I mean, it'd be just, Dollars and cents. Every, anyone watching this can admit that if you buy a $30 board game and that's it, I mean, it, there isn't always expansions or new stuff. It just kind of could end there. So there's right. a reason why miniature games are the driving force, even in a non magic time, um, to still be, you know, turning a profit and doing well. It's awesome. But yeah, I, I, if, if I was in your shoes, I don't even know if I'd have a board game, uh, frankly, yeah. because it just, now it's like, you would invite the because whenever someone starts a sentence with you know what you should do <laughs> <laughs> right sentences don't start like that you know right say, yeah. say you know this movie should you should film a movie <laughs> right. um so board games are kind of a different animal and i just don't know if i, I don't know a way to win the game of yeah. selling board games ever yeah and we looked into it initially and it's just not for us and that's okay not every game is for for every store right so so, that, so that's totally cool um you, you know the other you talked earlier about advice the only other kind of thing i would say you know if you're going to start a store like this is i guess flexibility would be the third one right so don't don't be too married to whatever it is you think is going to be the next big hit right because loan because it may be the next big hit for some period of time and then it's going to fall off the face of the earth and you're going to have to flex you're going to have to bend you're going to have to shift gears and go do something else right so like i said we've got we've got three categories we've got magic we've got 40 you know warhammer which is 40k and age of sigmar and all the other stuff and then everything else is literally our third category you could argue paint and tools but mostly paint stuff is going to be miniature gaming so it's kind of gw anyway right so everything else fits into that third category whether it's role-playing games or board games or every little goofy miniature or um, dice uh, you know terrain I mean all this kind of stuff kind of fits into this third category so we know what our our two mains are going to be and they're not going away anytime soon so we're going to be okay with those and we're it allows us to be flexible in our third category which is all the whole rest of the store that's the and hard so, part, though, right the, that's and that's, and that takes way more time and effort that that's 20% of our business takes 80% of our time, right? <clears throat> it really does. 
So, but that's what you have to do to really be successful. In my opinion, I guess you didn't have to do that to be successful. If we, if we said, you know what, tomorrow we're getting rid of everything in the store. We're going to sell games workshop, Citadel paint and magic, the gathering, and that's it. Could we be successful? Absolutely. If we're the best store in the area for magic and games workshop, we absolutely could be the best to be very successful doing that. And I think we've kind of, you know, it's oddly, we've kind of, you know, we've, we've kind of narrowed it down to where we're comfortable at. We're kind of known as a miniature game store. So we've kind of done that. We've kind of picked our lane and we did have a conversation, I don't know, at some period of time in, into the business, we kind of looked around and said, you know, are we going to spend any more money on this category? Or are we just going to do miniature games? Say we're kind of known as miniature game store. Well, let's just lean into it. Let's just be the best miniature game store around and, and magic does really well for us. So let's do those two things and just gradually grow everything else out that complements those things. And so, you know, at the time we had hardly any role-playing games in any D and D now we've got, you know, at least two full bookshelves full of that stuff. So we eventually grow into the things that make sense. Well, I noticed so, but you like, had to be flexible that way. Like your, your bones collection and display is just exponentially expanded. Right. Right. And, and I've and seen people just with their shopping bag, just, loading up on that stuff. <laughs> right yeah yeah shopping baskets were the best investment i made i think um you get giant carts like at costco now. <laughs> that's what i said we need hey, wider cart guy. Cart guy. Cart i can be guy. i can be shopping cart guy again one more time yeah for sure and that's part of it brian you know that's that's part of the growth so we started started very narrow uh, or very wide but not very deep and then we just keep getting wider and wider and wider and so we had some reaper models and some bones and then we got a little bit, so, so we had them, but then we don't, weren't very deep. We only had a few SKUs. And then we, now we started expanding the SKUs, expanding the SKUs. Now we carry everything in the Bones line. We have a, a spot on the shelf, every single model. And they, that line keeps growing. So every time it grows, we bring more in. And then the key would be, well, now we identify the ones that sell more of those. We sell two or three of those a week. We need to carry four a week. So then we start getting deeper in those things. And then we bring in a different miniatures line. So now we go wider there and then deeper in those. So that's, you know, wider and in, in other things to see if they work and deeper in the things that do work. If you and that flexibility is important. Yet, that third category, um, yes, probably the entire job and everything would be easier, but you would miss out on the, that other thing that makes you special. Right. You know, it's like, you know, if you go to a restaurant, whatever, and you get the best burger, the best fries, whatever that, we always get a shake at this place. I know it's not known for that, but that's what we, you know, you're going to miss that. And then if you want to delve into that side one day, you're not going to know what the hell you're doing because it's going to be completely foreign. Whereas you've actually had the ups and downs with the third category for the last four years, you know, whether it's, you know, this company or this game or this type of game, you, it gives you a much better sense. So in a weird way, you, by kind of taking those lumps and the extra time spent on the smallest part of the business, it does let you navigate a whole lot better. And that way of competition did come in and said, you know, hey, we're going to do magic and, G, and GW and the other stuff. At least, you know, well, there's no way the other stuff's going to be better than our other stuff because we've done the good and the bad and we've got, we've rolled with the punches throughout. So I think it's important to have that. And it's, as long as you can manage it from a, a time and personnel standpoint and, and being okay with a couple of losses, you know, yeah. you're going to get a few more wins, but I, that third category, I think is key because it yeah. gives you a really personality as a store. Yeah, it's already a niche market. If you niche, if you niche too much, then you start losing out miles. And so, I was going already, niche or niche. Yes, uh, and so, so we have to try to do what we can to stay with, you know, kind of stay in our lane, but uh, be diverse enough to give people more than one reason to come into the store. So. Yeah, we may have a really good GW section. You know, we try to carry one of everything for both Age of Sigmar and 40K and, and most, most, if not all, the side games. But if you if you just need a paint, then, you know, or a file or something, we need to give you another reason to come into the store. And so you can you can niche, niche yourself uh, out of a customer if you do that too much, right? So you want to be the best of this, but you also want to be good at other things too. And so but then you can go too far, right? We don't carry comics. We're never going to be a comic book store. We don't carry Funko Pops. We don't carry toys. Because you can't, Todd. Well, we could, but we but we don't. <laughs> never say never. You never never, you never know. Never say never. How but. much of success is is based and hinged upon not being next door to a shady vape store? <laughs> Well, we discovered it definitely had an impact on our business. So uh, good for us. We're not next door to a shady vape store. So, And is yeah. it true that Grognar Games used to sell pornography before it was Grognar Games? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I heard a rumor there's a place called Convenience Liquors and Adult Books. <laughs> well, 
I, I never visited that store, so I couldn't. Me neither, of course. <laughs> Did you happen to convert any uh, vapors into gamers, or vice versa? Uh, you had you had a vapor that was a gamer, but I think that was in place before he would go to your shop. Yeah, I, I literally know two people that were customers who bought things at at the vape shop and and they never did it again so now were they buying vapes or the other thing they sold i i assume i don't know much about and, vaping so i'm assuming they were buying you know vapes i don't even know everybody, what that means How do you buy has vapes? That, everyone has the magical third category it's different for every business yes. <laughs> right that was their third category the vape store i think had a third category yeah um any other questions from the uh the unwashed so one thing I, I know it, everyone says location, location, location. One thing I was always interested in, and I know you and Adrian have had this conversation of, why don't we go bigger and really, but then you have to realize, how do we make that monthly nut selling what we currently sell? And how, how much have you looked at different locations? I've looked around quite a bit and it is, it is a lot that, right? So one of the reasons, again, when we started small and uh, undercapitalized, you have to take kind of what you can get, what you can afford. Mm -hmm. And so if we move to a better location, we're going to pay more. If we move to a bigger location, that's going to be nicer. We're going to pay more times two. And then suddenly, you know, that becomes a larger percentage of our, you know, as a fixed cost, that becomes yep. a larger percentage of our monthly sales. And so we can now look at our monthly sales and, and say, okay, well, this is what we can afford now up to a certain percentage and really more than that it's we're not comfortable with that fixed cost but you know our fixed cost when we first started was really high percentage ways percentage wise on what we were selling monthly now it's not at all like now it's now it's very comfortable and in fact it's probably a little low so uh, now part of that is we're in chicago where uh rental renting anything in the greater chicagoland area is absolutely ludicrous amounts of money it is yeah. literally two yeah. to three times what it is some for some of my um you know uh uh, friends that I have that own game stores in other parts of the country. It's ridiculous. The amount that we have to pay for, for retail for space. Get, sure, yeah. yeah. So, so it's hard to move anyway. And then when you move, you figure you're going to lose 10% of your customers, no matter what you do. That's just kind of an old, old school retail axiom. I don't know how true it is, but that's what they always say, but we have, have been looking at, at it. I have talked to other uh, realtors, talked to realtors about other locations. We are definitely going to stay local. Like I'm not going to just pick up and move to, you know, South Holland or something like we're not moving way down the street. You know, if we move, we're looking in, uh, you know, a few miles at most away from the existing location, which does limit us quite a bit. I've looked outside of that area as well. Um, but I have, haven't seen anything that I'm comfortable with. There's a couple of promising things that are going to be more money, and, but will definitely be larger and will definitely be nicer. Like one of the things we want to, if we move, we want it to be nicer so that we right. can get that magic premium so that we can just upgrade our look uh, all around and uh, have a little bit more space for gaming and, and grow our retail space as well. So we're definitely looking. And how much, like when, when you first opened, how much your, how much of your budget percent wise is like build out? Cause that always fascinates me where you see what people spend on the build out is insane. And I think a lot of people overspend on that. when they start. Everybody it. overspends on that. Yeah. And that's, but, but that's kind of why I say, you know, when you start, you know, if you're going to start with uh, 35 or, or, you know, what do we, 50 grand or whatever it is, you should probably have a hundred because, oh, uh, well, we're going to just going to, what are you going to do with the floor? Like, oh, we're going to get carpet. Okay. How much is that going to be? Oh, the, the used uh, secondhand, you know, carpet squares that we got still cost us almost three grand. Right. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that you don't under like, holy but cow, how much would it have been new? Cause that was, right. or, or and, could, and I think it ended, ended up great. Cause I'd love the look of it, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 And just weird things like that always end up costing you way more money than they think than they're, yep. they're going to cost. So, you know, we absolutely did it on a budget. You know, I was literally, you know, like your John said earlier, I was, was buying fixtures from sports authorities that were going out of business because I was getting them for a, for a, a song yep. rather than buying, you know, I could have bought one four foot uh, uh, fixture for the same price. I bought a 16 foot fixture that was on wheels and worked great for us for over two years. Right. Mm -hmm. So you spray paint it, you make it look pretty, you put it up and it's, and it, and it works. And that's what you have to do to get started. And so, you know, now that we, thing about moving is it's not like opening a new store because we've already got all the stuff. We just have to put it in a new location. So there's still going to be expense with moving. Most of the expense comes with um, any loss of customers that you're going to have because, you know, invariably, for five years after you move, people are going to say they had no clue that you moved, even though you tell them for a year and a half, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. So, and for as a new much location, moving, why, why have you picked Lake Zurich? 
<laughs> well, that's our dream location, Brian, but we haven't settled on that yet. So that's actually right now it's still gonna be the Schomburg area. Second location in Viron. Um there you go. He's accepting applications. Yeah, so, right. Exactly. Um one thing I think is important is Todd, you mentioned kind of um, you know, when you know using Viron's location as everything principle that people always talk about. It's almost like like buying a house. There's there's so, somewhere in between. You don't want like the lowest of the low, both in the house and the area. You also can't do this either. So you have to have this like, what are we okay with, and what are our customers okay with? So for example, you said you started off a little cheaper than you could have, but you still made custom tables with your logo and like you know it was like you still you didn't. I don't even like you didn't skimp on everything. Like if you you hit a because if you if you start off where everything is on a budget, then right. what if you don't get a second chance with that person? And right. You start off with this hundred thousand dollar build out, like you see on these uh, these shows where they re re renovate something. It's like yeah, we're never going to see this money again. So yeah, Rock Nerds was was looking for a Target look on a Walmart budget. That's a good way. To look. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. Kind of, we want to feel like we're better than the lowest, but what people don't know won't, won't hurt them either. What really, you know, went into what it. What goes I, on I, in the closet in the back, they don't need to Of course. Know. I think yeah. that's a big part of it. And, and that's where I think your experience, both from owning a store, but then also, like you said, even your, your other job, talking to small business owners and knowing the financial side of what really is needed here and what can we get by with here? Um, yeah. and, and, and which of those do we lean heavier? Do we want to just get by? Or do we really want to, you know, wow somebody? And that's, I think, like, everybody would screw that up. Because I'm, I'm sure not every decision was the, the best ever. But that's that barometer of, like, like if you keep making the decisions that are either too shitty for what you are or way better than you think you are, it's eventually going to bite you. And I think you've, you've done a good job navigating that. Thanks. And so here's, here's another advice. So a lot of times I think people, people who have money spend money, right? So if you had you know, if you had a quarter million dollars to spend on opening the store, but you only really had to spend half of that to really get the store that you wanted to then grow into the half million dollar or a quarter million dollar store, that's what you should do. But I think too many people, and I'm not, there's not that there's hundreds of examples of this, but probably in business there is, um, you know, it's one thing if you're opening a high-end bar, but if you're opening kind of a more casual kind of environment like we're doing, even if I had had another 50 or 60 or hundred thousand dollars, I probably shouldn't have spent all of that right away on things because a, you're going to make mistakes and B, like you said, you don't really need to have the highest quality, you know, uh, nicest tables from wherever I had my friend Jason make them and they cost me 50 bucks a piece and they work great. Like they're phenomenal. Right. Um, I could have bought $650 tables from Julio when we first opened, but that would be silly money to spend right away. So just because, you know, the advice would be just because you have the money doesn't mean you have to spend it at least right away, you know, do some research and, and spend it smart, right? We, we knew we needed nice cases for our magic cards because we we're going to have magic cards on display that cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So we bought really nice brand new cases to put our magic cards in because that made sense. The tables we spent 50 bucks each on and had my buddy make them, you know what I mean? So and then, like you were saying, the, the, the labeled tables, the, um, uh, you know, tables with Grognard on them, I made myself, right? And I don't know how to make a table to save my life, but I made a, I made some tables so that we could play some games on them, right? And I did buy you some tables at legs. Walmart. So you have to kind of do what you got to do. <clears throat> you had four legs. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 means, it, right? <laughs> it was a table. <laughs> uh, and it was, yeah. what other store has branded tables? Honestly, right. I, I don't know any. I, I really, I've been to tons of game stores and I know what, so I mean, that's a little thing that a little kind of uh, elbow grease and ingenuity kind of helped out. And, and I think the advice you just gave is very profound. The um, just because you, you have the money, you shouldn't spend it. Because the average, I mean, anyone who starts a business and if you have the right ego, the right mentality, the right um, kind of uh, whatever gave you that creative energy to do it, you're going to want the best possible. Passion's so, the word you're looking for, John. Exactly. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> Because there's actually, I'm, a, I'm not afraid of passion. Well, there's a Todd Bingo game going. I didn't right. want to it. <laughs> right. Uh, there's we're, literally we're already, a Todd Bingo game going. Literally. Yeah. He said literally that we already had a cover all. So, whatever. Right. Yeah, um, right. but if, if I was doing it and I knew in the back of my head, I had X amount of dollars, I would blow the wad because I would say anything less means I'm not giving it my all. People right. think 
giving it their all passion, you know, as passionate as they can means all of that. It's like, no, you, you need somebody with their head not in the clouds, firmly planted on the earth to tell you, no, 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 no. $50 tables, we'll still have a 40K tournament, but we mm. got to have a nice case for this. Well, why? Because this needs that. And this mm. is okay with this. And right. it, it's not going to matter that one of them costs less in the big picture. And you, you know, you've, you've been through it, but you also probably had, I think like, you know, obviously you and Howie with the experience, I'm going to, I would be, be willing to bet that Adrian has been very helpful in the, like, I'm, I can help you keep your feet planted. Well, Adrian is a good compliment to me because he's a very much a, 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 a thinker and a planner and I'm a doer, right? So I want to, if I have an idea, I go do it. I, I, and I'm real good at doing it on a budget, but I want to get it done, right? Adrian is the other way around. So when we decided we were going to do the carpet squares of all the different colors and kind of do this, you know, this motley patch of colors on the floor, uh, I, I found them and I priced them and I'm like, here's what we're going to get. And I said, here's what we're going to do, Adrian, let's go do it. And he's like, okay, well, what are the colors? I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Like, let's just go get them and do it. And he's like, give me the colors and then I'll, we'll get, we'll bring them all in and I'll make a, a layout and we'll get it and it'll look really good. And I'm like, well, why don't we just put them out? He's, he's like, give me 24 hours or give me 48 hours and I'll have a nice plan. And he did a spreadsheet and had them all, each individual color had them labeled. And then, then we brought in half a dozen people and we all laid them out exactly in Adrian's pattern. So that was like, that was a, and it looked great. Like if I had done it, it, it would have been done in, in two hours, but it would have looked horrible. Right. So Adrian is a good compliment to me because I'm very much a, I want to do it and I get it done. And I'm, I'm the guy that um, uh, I don't, I don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, right? Like if this is good enough, like the $50 tables are good enough, but, but we need these over here. Whereas Adrian, not that he's going to have grand plans or anything, but he's just very much the planner and I'm very much the doer. So we, we complement each other. Well, I think I, I would agree with that. And it's good to have those people there. I mean, I can make the comparison. Adrian makes love, whereas Todd has sex and how, <laughs> and how he fucks. Wow. <laughs> Bing, got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing I probably nailed it, even if you don't want to admit it. Yeah, um, I don't. I'm um, not sure about uh, that, but okay. Um, any other questions you guys think people want to know about the game store business? Did we cover it all? Todd, if someone's watching this, and wants to do it first is don't <laughs> right. because if you're in the chicago area now they're competition and we don't want that well um, <laughs> but if i can talk about that too but yeah that's okay todd's not afraid of competition i'm not afraid of competition that's number one yes He'll squash it he forces it forces innovation competition makes everybody better and you know i, I want to extend the podcast but you could you could do a whole podcast just on that and how many game stores exist now that didn't exist when we opened and how many game stores are different now than they are than they were when when we opened so i think and, that there's something to be said of, for competition some of them went low you went high and you're still here i like right. that uh if you want to purchase things from grognar games go to grognargames.com be yep. right i would love for you to put that on the screen right now if you can grognar games like encyclopedia. dinner and tournament like there's the encyclopedia. <laughs> there's the number uh so you can buy stuff todd will ship it out i think yep. 100 bucks is free shipping still yep right? mm -hmm. yeah right. and, and it's escalating so yeah it's a few bucks underneath that but 100 bucks is free and if you're in the area and even just if you are a midwesterner and you know you have that thing where you everybody does that when you travel and you go on road trips we always go to game stores yep. we right. always look it up and thankfully the internet makes it easy it used to be like you know a phone book or something or to ask your friends and they have the now, rating app where you can say smells like cat piss, which is the ones I go to when I'm on travel. They all smell like cat piss. Well, they actually should all start with that. You have to uncheck it. I'm yeah, verify no cat piss smell. Like, you know what? Five stars, no cat piss. <laughs> go figure. Um, so definitely check out Grognard Games in Rose, Illinois. It's become its own, like, country. You know, it is our uh, Pangea, if you will. It's a southern uh, suburb of Schaumburg. So. Yeah, yeah. It's part of the greater Schaumburg area, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, Roselle is a very uh, well known town, not well known like Schaumburg, but a quick did you know about Roselle for Chicagoans here? Did you know that in Roselle, that uh, the Bozo shows Cookie and Wizzo both lived in Roselle? There is a house 
on Roselle Road, it's three level, like a three flats. One lived on the top, one lived on the bottom, and they practiced skits in the middle. Wow. That's a, that's I a heard it from, right there. I heard it from Dean, who heard it from one of his friends who does a lot of drugs. And so I think <laughs> that is a real story. I mean, it's a story. It's, it's, it's a true. story. So definitely check out Grognard Games. Any uh, closing words from the, the crew about Grognard? It is without a doubt the finest store that has been or ever will be. Okay. I am glad you've opened it. Yes. It has changed Thank my you. life. Yeah. Thank you. If Todd wasn't there, we would be putting tables on top of tables at card game stores. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like that that's a fun way to play Warhammer because the table is like you're reaching down and it's teeter tottering on a small and table. none of us are getting any younger. It's not comfortable. So oh. you ha you have to play games at a game store. That's just how it goes. Extreme, you've been a couple times. Your thoughts on Grognar games? No, it's really awesome. There's uh, plenty of space to play games, which is very nice. You don't feel like you're um, crowded in a back room or something. It's a cool stories. Just definitely check it out. If there's an Indianapolis location one day, you might have your man right there, Todd. There you go. Yeah, Indy's got some good game stores, so there would be definitely some competition there. There would be. Awesome. Well, follow Slurpcast as Slurpcast on all the social medias, and of course, follow Grognard Games. I believe it's at Grognard Games on everything. It might yeah, be Grognard every, Games Store on a couple. Everything of is Grognard Games. I think Twitter that I don't look at very often because I'm a Grognard is Twitter Store maybe, but or G Grognard Game Store. But can I can I say something real quick before we wrap up? Of course, Todd. I, I just want to say thanks for having me on. I do appreciate it, and of course, uh, the store would not exist if it weren't for for you guys, my friends. And uh, you know, one of the reasons I, I like to play games is because I like to play games with you guys, my friends, and. And, you know, we were playing games at, in crowded stores and in weird places and meeting at uh, beef shacks so that we could uh, have some have some conversation before we got to the store because uh, people were knocking over our tables and we were having to put uh, tabletops on card tables in order to play our little four by four game or whatever. Someone next to us so was eating kimchi. Somebody next to us is eating kimchi and wearing a brown coat. And, the, and, and I literally am sitting next to a 32 gallon a drum of garbage while I'm playing uh, one half of Blood Bowl. And so the reason, one of the many reasons I opened the store is because of those experiences, right? I mean, it's, it's great that those places exist and for the people that enjoy going there, th that's fine, that's that's good for them. But I, I, I wanted to create the store so I could hang out with you guys, my friends. And so I thank you for having me on the show. And I know that I probably come up every episode. I haven't watched every episode, but- what? Um, I, I've watched most of the episodes. So I appreciate the mentions that I get uh, regardless of how much we like to talk about genitalia or poo poo and pee pee, that's okay. That's it's, it's fine. Um, it's all normalized but, now. But, but I do, I do appreciate it. I do, I really do. I genuinely appreciate the mentions, and I know you guys um, have been very kind to the store and, and the mentions that way too. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, you are totally welcome. And I have to wonder if the sick feeling in your stomach was from the garbage can or actually playing Blood Bowl. I don't. I'd probably a fair fair amount of both. Probably. I did puke while playing Mike and Blood Bowl at Gaming Goat. <laughs> I believe there was a Chaos Cup I ran where people were puking, like <laughs> like in the middle of the tournament. So I mean, some games evoke like just physical reactions. Sure. You can't control it. Um, extreme. You've lost a lot of sleep over Blood Bowl. You know your ranking went down one notch. You know things happen. We should have like a little like real time ranking of where Extreme's Blood Bowl ranking is during the show, and we could see it count down as more people play. You know, something I wanted for years was if you don't play that team anymore, it goes down naturally. Yeah, because you just retire on top. And I always thought that was bullshit. You know, to do that, Extreme probably says no, it's not bullshit because. Geez. Well, they have that now. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, well then. That's a new thing that they've introduced: is your rankings will go down if you don't play that team. Oh, okay. uh, it's not enough to get back in, but I appreciate the insight. <laughs> um, Todd, thanks again for having the store. And when Grognar 2 opens, wherever that may be, or the new location, we'll definitely do this again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, guys. Bye-bye. Right.
Brought to you by Nuffles. Bet you can't just roll a one.